kind of interesting that here in America now, at Christmas time, we are celebrating the birth of someone that many refuse to acknowledge. We, uh, we have some uh, birthday celebrations for past presidents. We have George Washington Day, uh, Abraham Lincoln, President's Day, Martin Luther King Day. We celebrate their birthdays, but yet if we try to celebrate the birth of Jesus, it seems like there's lots of opposition to that. Now, we don't want to stop the celebration. We want to have the party. We just don't want to mention Jesus' name when we do that. Um, that would make us think that Jesus in some way has, uh, has no significance. If Jesus um, is less important, make us think that he's less important than George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King. And, and so is he insignificant? Should, uh, should we be silenced and not want to mention his name? We must, I think, uh, as a church, help people understand who Jesus is. So many people do not know uh, who the baby in the manger uh, really is. Uh, who is that baby? Well, you know, there's lots of new toys we have today. Uh, we have these little deals. Um, some are called Echo, some Alexa. And you can ask them questions, right? Uh, ask them any question. My phone's like that. I don't know if this will work over here or not. But uh, I have a go-to person on my phone. I can ask any question. She says, what can I help you with? Go ahead, I'm listening. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Maybe she doesn't know. Who is Jesus? Here's some information. Jesus, Jewish preacher and religious leader. Jesus, also referred to as Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus Christ, was a first century Jewish preacher and religious leader. He is the central figure of Christianity. Place of birth, uh, Bethlehem. Place of death, Calvary. Parents, Joseph and Virgin Mary. That's good, Virgin Mary. His field of work. He was a carpenter. He was a carpenter. So that's how the world sees Jesus today. Uh, some more, some less. But I was told, and I don't know, I, I couldn't prove this, but one of those little deals that you ask questions to, one of them, if you ask them who's Jesus, they will say, or it will say, he's a fictional character. Uh, they don't believe that, that he is true or that he really existed. So, people like Christmas. They like the parties, the gifts. They even like the story of a little baby in a manger. But they miss who he was. And they miss who he is. And they miss what he can do. Back in 1938, uh, referred to then as a, as a Negro spiritual or a black spiritual, and you know this song really well. It was, and here's the way it went: "Sweet little Jesus boy, they made you be born in a manger. Sweet little holy child, they didn't know who you was." And it's the same today. They uh, talk about a baby in a manger. But they really don't know or they don't want to know exactly who he is. Well, as I told you a few minutes ago in their scripture reading, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19, tell us exactly who Jesus is. And we're going to read about that this morning and preach about that this morning. And then uh, next week, we're going to, uh, we're going to look at uh, some names of Jesus and what that means. We're going to we're going to look at that name, Emmanuel, next week. And uh, another week before Christmas, we're going to talk about Jesus being the light of the world and what it means to be the light of the world. And then we're going to talk about Jesus and the name Jesus, exactly 
what that means. So we're going to be spending some time these weeks with Christmas coming up talking about the person of Christ Jesus. But this morning, I've already read to you from Colossians a number of verses, but I want to go back and I want to read to with you again, verse, specifically verses 15 through 19, and then we're going to look at those four verses one at a time. Would you stand with me again, please, for the reading uh, of God's Word? Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 15 through 19. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. Let's pray again. Father, again, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. May we be receptive to what these four verses say. And may we leave here today having a greater appreciation, a greater understanding, a greater acknowledgement, and a greater heart for worship. Because, Lord, You are all these things, regardless of what the world says today, these four verses. Tell us who you are and the magnitude of who you are and what that means for us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Again, you can be seated. These verses, as I told you, are absolutely exclusive of Jesus. This is not talking about anyone else. He is to be, one of those verses, verse 18 says, He is to be preeminent or He is to be the first in everything. Nobody else is, is any of these sayings except for Jesus Himself. He, he's unique. There's, uh, there's no one like Him. And if we're going to slight somebody on their birthday, it needs to be someone else other than Jesus, the God-man. This is Emmanuel, God with us. This is Jesus, the Savior of the world. This is Jesus, the light of the world. This is God coming to save man. And if there ever should be a celebration for anyone, there should be a celebration for Him. And as we look at these verses, these verses speak to five different relationships that Jesus has. First, we see the relationship with God the Father. Then we see His relationship to creation. Then we see His relationship to the unseen world. Then we see His relationship to the church. And then God put in a, a catch-all, number five, we see His relationship to everything else outside of those four. Look with me again, verse 15. His relationship to God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. This is exactly on Wednesday nights. We've been going through the book of Revelation, and uh, we've gone through chapters 4 and 5 the last two Wednesday nights. We've got a picture of the throne room in heaven. John is caught up into heaven. There's an open door. He's there in the throne room of heaven. He sees God the Father on the throne, and, and he's not described as a person, but he's described as, as lights and many other things. And then in chapter 5, we see Jesus there in the throne room also. This verse says Jesus is the, invis is the image of the invisible God. If you've never seen God, you can see Him in the person of Christ Jesus. When you see Jesus, then you in fact have seen God. He, he's the image. He is the exact replica. He is the reproduction of of God Himself. I told you about Hebrews, the first four verses in chapter 1 of Hebrews. Here's what Hebrews uh, verse 3 says. Chapter 1 verse 3. Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. That's talking about God. Jesus is the express image of God Himself. And upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is the express image of the Father. That means He is an exact representation 
of God and of His nature. He's the shining forth of God. He's the essence and the substance of God. He's like dye or a stamp. He, he replicates God. Look at John chapter 14, verse 9. One of the disciples said to Jesus, Show us the Father and, and we'll, be, we'll be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? Philip? He said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus said, if you've seen me, then you've seen God the Father. Because we are the same. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, look at this verse. Whose mind the God of this age has, has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is what? He is the image of God. The image of God should shine on them. So over and over and over again in Scripture, May it be crystal clear that Jesus is God in, and, we, and when He came to the earth, He was God in human flesh. My favorite preacher, Adrian Rogers, says the only God you will ever see is Jesus. If God... Ask yourself this question. If God were a man, what kind of man would He be? If God were a man, what kind of man would He be? What would we expect Him to be like, right? Would we not, since God is righteous and holy and perfect, would we not expect that man to be sinless? Would we not? And Jesus lived a perfect sinless life, we know from Scripture. As a matter of fact, when they put Jesus on trial before they crucified Him, and they took Him to, 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 to the judges and, and, and the governors and, and all those people, and they, and they listened to to all of the, the, the complaints against them, what did they say? They said, we find no fault in this man. We find no fault. He was perfect. He was sinless. If God was a man, we would expect Him to be perfect and without sin. And Jesus was perfect and without sin. If God was a man, would we not expect Him to speak the most profound and, and greatest words ever spoken? And Jesus did that as Jesus went about ministering and preaching and teaching and being confronted. What did the people say? They said, we have never heard any man speak like this. When they listened to Jesus, they said, we, we've never heard a man speak like he speaks. If God were a man, would he not have impact and influence on humanity? And, and Jesus did. Think of those, those disciples. Those disciples, uh, uh, Scripture said, and His followers turned the world upside down. They, he, he, what, when, when people were with Him and listened to Him, He transformed them. And He's still transforming miracles today. Or transforming people today. If God were a man, we would expect Him to do miracles. And Jesus did mir many miracles that's recorded in Scripture. But at one place said, if, if we tried to record everything this man did, that Jesus did, they said there wouldn't be enough books to write it in. That's how many amazing things He did. When He was here, and He was only here for about three years. If God were a man, would we not expect Him to know the future? And read Matthew chapter 24 when Jesus expounded upon what's coming. The book of Revelation is telling us what's coming. Jesus did and does know the future. And if God were a man, what kind of qualities would He have? And we saw in Jesus love and, and kindness and mercy and grace and forgiveness, fairness, virtue, wisdom like which the world had never seen. If God could be a man, you know who He would be and who He is? He's Jesus. Jesus makes the invisible God visible. If you want to see God and know what God's like, just study Jesus. And when we trivialize His birth, then, then that's a huge form of blasphemy on our part. He, and, but not only in, in, uh, in verse 15 was He... Uh, the image of God. He's the image of the invisible God, but He's also what? He is the firstborn. The firstborn over all creation. Now, in our Sunday school lesson this morning, we were in, in Genesis uh, and, and, and looking at uh, 
Isaac and, and Jacob and, and Esau and this struggle over the firstborn uh, and, and the inheritance or the blessing for the firstborn in the family. In, in, in ancient times, the firstborn was the heir, the ranking one, the one who received everything. Now, Jesus is, was not the firstborn man on earth, right? Adam was the firstborn man on earth. But, but this says that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. So, so how could that be? Well, look at Psalm 89.27. Here's what God said. God, speaking of Jesus, also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. God said he may not have been the first man born on the earth, but I'm going to make him my firstborn. And, and, and everything is going to fall. Everything's going to fall to him. He, he's the ranking one. He's, he's going to receive everything. And again, Hebrews chapter 1 and, uh, and verse 2. He has in these last days spoken to us by his son, who he has appointed what? Heir of all things. God said, I'm making him my firstborn. He is heir to everything, through whom also he made the worlds. And again, it tells us he's our creator. In, in, in relation to God, Jesus is the exact replication of God. And out of all who has been created, Jesus is the ranking and the ultimate one. So Thomas, one of the disciples, was right after Jesus showed him the, the nail prints in his hands, and Thomas cried out and said, My Lord and my God, because Jesus was in fact God in the flesh. So we see God or Jesus' relationship to God. He's a, he's a perfect image of God. He's God in the flesh. But what about his relationship now in verse 16? Colossians 1.16, what about his relationship to the world and creation? For by him, Jesus, all things, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, that are visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities and powers, all things were created through him and for him. That verse in three places says, number one, things were created by him, things were created through him, and things were created for him. Jesus is our creator. Our creator. And uh, I think when we, when we uh, pass into the new year, 2019, our first messages in January, we're going to take a look at the six days of creation, one day at a time, and then the day of rest. And, 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 and we're going to talk about Jesus and God and, and, and creation. But this verse says, all things were created by Him. He's the Creator, and He is the Sustainer of the whole world, of the whole universe. Um, again, Hebrews 1-2 said, He made the worlds. When you think about our universe that we live in, and uh, you may have enjoyed science, you may have not in school, and, and, and our, our students here are, are in the middle of, of uh, science courses, I'm sure. The sun is so much larger than the earth, you can put 1.2 million earths inside the sun. That's how much bigger the sun is uh, than the earth. The sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. But the moon, the moon is only 211,000 miles away. Just a good walk, really. If, uh, if you're a walker, if you would walk 24 miles a day, you could walk to the moon in 27 years. So there's a good walk for you. Uh, 27 years, 24 miles a day, you could walk to the moon. Uh, now we know light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So light can reach the moon in just over a second. Now if you and I could travel that fast, the speed of light, we could reach, uh, we could reach the, the, the planet Venus in two minutes. That's 26 million miles away. We could, uh, we could reach Mars 34 million miles away in, in, in about four minutes, 21 seconds. We could reach Mercury 50 million miles away in about uh, four and a half minutes. And, 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 and on and on we could go to the different planets in our universe uh, until we got to a planet that they have named now Beetlejuice, 
that planet is 880 quadrillion miles away. And its, it, and its diameter, the planet itself, is bigger than the Earth's orbit. So, so think about creation. We live on the planet Earth. And when we get into creation, we're going to read a verse that says, God created the Earth to be inhabited. In other words, when He created the Earth, and the Earth is just this tiny little planet in, in, in the middle of this vast universe. I mean, it's not even a speck. But the Bible says He created this planet specifically that it could uh, accommodate life. And, and it's a place where man can live. And, and it's amazing to me if we just listen to that one verse. This is the only planet God has created for life. And, and yet we're spending, what, billions of dollars. And we're trying to find out something landed on Mars this week, right? We're looking for life on other planets. God's already told us the only planet He created for life is the planet that you and I live on right here. But all these things, this great creation, who made all that? This verse says Jesus did. The baby in the manger. He's the Creator. He made it good. He made it very good. And man tainted it with sin. And, and Jesus is coming back one day and He's going to recreate this whole earth. And, and it's going to become the place He intended for it to be. All things were created by Him and, and, and were created for Him. But not only did He create it, Look at verse 17. And He is before all things. Before they were ever created, He was with God and is God. And look what the second part of that verse says. In Him all things what? Consist. Not only did He make all things, but He keeps them running as they should. He, he's in charge of keeping things going. All things consist. In him, he keeps him moving. Look at it. Look inside an atom. You got these protons and neutrons, and and they're all moving. If the Earth and our rotation around the Sun, if if it slowed down, uh, or if it sped up, we could freeze to death, or we could burn up. If the Moon didn't remain ex the exact distance from the Earth as it is, the tides of the ocean would cover the Earth completely with water. Who keeps everything moving right? Jesus, the baby in the manger. He is the Creator, and He's also the Sustainer. He's the beginning of creation. He's the end of creation. He is the upholder of creation. And He is the goal of creation. So we see Jesus, His relationship to God. We see Jesus, His relationship to creation. Third, we see Jesus and His relationship to the unseen world. We go back to verse 16. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and then invisible. Where the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and by Him. Listen, folks, there is an unseen world that you and I can't see with our eyes. There are angels. There are fallen angels. There are demons. There are, there are armies. And this verse says that, that He created everything visible and invisible. The ranks of angels. He's creator and king over the angels. The angelic beings are subject to Him. When the angels came and sang, as Carl talked about this morning, and they sang glory to God in the, high, the highest, they, the little baby they were singing to created them. He was their creator. Even the fallen angels, we know from, from Scripture throughout the New Testament, the fallen angels and the demons knew who Jesus was and they trembled at who Jesus was and what He could do. So, we see His relationship to the unseen world. Fourth, we see His relationship to the church. Look at verse 18. And He is the head of the body, the church. The church is the body. He is the head. Who is the beginning, and He is again the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have preeminence. The church is like a body. Christ is the head. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is the creation of Christ Jesus. Now folks, I know we have business meetings and we have committees and we operate a lot like an organization. And we say church, we, we are organized, we have an organization, we have rules of order and, and uh, we, we, have, we have all these things. We have bylaws. And if you're not careful, we can get caught up in thinking the church is nothing more than an organization like any other organization. 
But let me tell you what, we may have some bylaws and things that, uh, that help to guide us, but the church is not an organization. The church is a living organism. It's alive. It's a body. It's alive. And it has body parts. And it has a job to do. But the head is Christ. And any time we get the head replaced with, uh, with, with, with organization and committees, then we're headed down the road. We might, we might be really organized, but we have, we have eliminated the Holy Spirit power from the body, from the church. So we, we, a, a, an, an organism, a body will grow. We talk about we need church growth. A body will grow if you feed it properly, if it has water, if it has light, and we do the things to make it healthy, then a body will grow. And that's what we have to do as a church. It, a church needs to be fed properly. The water, the light, the things of the Spirit will make a church grow. So, the church is Christ's creation. And He's also... The firstborn, in the middle of that verse, it says he is the firstborn from the dead. Here we go again talking about the firstborn. Now Jesus wasn't the first person to ever be resurrected. There is some resurrected before Jesus. But listen, from all that have ever been raised or ever will be raised from the dead, he is the supreme one. He is, by, In God's eyes, he is considered the firstborn. And His resurrection is a guarantee of mine and your resurrection into life eternal if we will believe on Him and receive Him. The Bible says in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, says if Christ is not risen, our preaching and our faith is empty, it's dead. But He has raised from the dead. He was resurrected. He's not a dead hero. He's the resurrected God-man. And of all that have ever come up from the dead, he is a supreme one, and He's alive, and He's the head of the body of the church. And then fifth and last, the catch-all. The writer said, here, here, here's who Jesus is in relationship to God, in relationship to creation, in relationship to the unseen world, in relationship to the church. And now... In verse 19, he says this, For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. It pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness... He, he is the fullness of everything. It is Him and Him alone that God has put all the fullness of His deity in Christ Jesus. Now that's who Jesus is. And then he tells us again, those two questions we've been been mentioning uh, lately who is Jesus and why did he come? Those first four verses tell us who he is. Now, why did he come? Verse 20 through 22. Look at verse 20. And by him, he came to reconcile all things to himself. By him were the things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Look at the next verse. Having made peace through the blood of His cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He is reconciled in the body of His flesh through death, that He might present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. Did you get that? Why did He come? He came to die in your place. He came to reconcile you to God. That one day, Jesus says, He will present you and me holy, blameless, and above reproach in the very presence of God Himself. I don't know about you, but I was praying last night getting ready to preach today. And I said, God, I'm so unworthy to preach this message. And God reminded me, that's why I came. I know you are. That's why I came. But by my work, not yours. By my goodness, not yours. By my righteousness, not yours. One day, one day, I will present you to the Father. And from the Father's eyes that day, you will be holy, and you will be blameless, and you will be above reproach. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day. That we leave this old sinful body, this old flesh, and all the sin 
that's in it, and, and Jesus will complete His mission to make us just like Himself. And we will be accepted in the eyes of the Father, not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is and what He has done for us. He came to remove the curse of sin from the universe. He came to restore the earth. He came to gather men and women and to present us before God the Father holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. He took on flesh that we might become holy as He is holy. And that, folks, is the meaning of Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. He came to do that. Jesus, His name is Jesus. He came to save His people from their sins. God became man that He might save man. And you'll hear people say, well, does it really matter? Does it really matter? Does Jesus really have to be God? We have many false religions out there that will teach a lot of good things about Jesus. I saw uh, driving somewhere the other day, going through a small town, and, and they had a big banner up across the street about a manger scene. And I thought, well, how wonderful that is. And then I saw that it was sponsored by the Mormon church. And I thought, here's the Mormon church having a manger scene, the baby in a manger. We all like that. However, they don't believe who Jesus is the way we do. They don't believe what the Scripture we read today says about who Jesus is. But that's why He came. He came to save us and to present us to the Father as holy. God is a creator and sustainer. God is over all the angels in the unseen world. God is head over the church. He's preeminent in all things. He's above and beyond and in control of all things. But you say, well, does it really make a difference? Well, let me tell you what kind of difference it makes. It makes a difference between heaven and hell. It's like being on an airplane, and the airplane's going to crash. And on one side of that plane over the seats, there's a row of parachutes. And on the other side of that plane over the other seats, there's a row of backpacks. Now, if you're going to jump out of that plane, let me ask you something. Do you want a backpack that looks like a parachute? Or do you want a parachute? I want the parachute, don't you? And that's the difference, folks. One leads to death. They may look the same. But if anybody preaches and teaches that Jesus is anything other than what we read this morning, then you're just carrying a backpack. And it won't do any good when the plane crashes. One, you will die. The other, you will live. So as we enter this Christmas season, what will you do with Jesus? Will you give Him His rightful place in your heart? Will you acknowledge Him as all these things we've read about in Scripture? Or will you like the world? You'll enjoy the celebration, but you will not give Jesus His rightful place. Would you stand with me? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? Carl and Kathy's getting ready to lead us in an invitation song. But before we, before we do that, let me ask you, do you believe Jesus is all the things Scripture said this morning? Do you believe that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God? Do you believe that He was right there at the beginning? He created everything, created by Him, for Him, through Him, with Him. And do you believe he, everything consists, everything is held together by Jesus today? Do you believe that He is in charge? He created, He's in charge of this, all this invisible world. Angels, devils, demons, fallen angels. He created all of them and He controls them. They, 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 they shudder, they, they tremble because they know who Jesus is. Do you believe He's head of the church? Do you believe He's head of who we are here today at the Fellowship of Field Store? We're the body. We make up body parts, but He's the head. And do you believe He came to die for you? And one day, one day, He will present us to the Father in His righteousness, in His holiness, in a body just like His, and we will forever be with Him in eternity. I hope you believe that. If you have, you can really enjoy Christmas 
If you haven't, I don't care how much money you spend or how many presents you get, you'll miss the true meaning of Christmas. We're going to extend an invitation to you to do uh, what we ask you to do each week. If you've never been saved, if you've never received Christ Jesus, the Lord and Savior, I'm going to invite you to come and, and, and pray with you. And may you surrender your life to Him today and acknowledge Him for who He is, not for who the world says He is. If you have been saved and never baptized, I invite you to come and, and talk with me. And let's pick a day and let's have a celebration and follow the Lord and believers' baptism. That's your first that's your first step of obedience once you get saved is to be baptized. If you are saved and baptized, but you're not a member of a local church, and you believe God is leading you to come and be a part of this church, then uh, I invite you to come and, and, uh, and share with me that you, you believe God's calling you here to be a member. And, and we'll talk about what, where we go from here, the, the, uh, the, the, the members' orientation class, and, and the things that we need to verify for you to become a member. Whatever your need is, as we sing this song, I'm going to get right down front, and I invite you to come, and let's pray together. Carl, would you?